Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Jamel Herring, an American hero, somebody who has a fantastic book, which I've got right here. I read that on a plane to Mexico. I thought it was fantastic. Reading all about your sensational story. I want to talk to you about it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome, Jamel. Right from the start, obviously, a Marine, an American hero. And there was one point in the book where you're talking about being on the base, watching Floyd Mayweather versus Oscar De La Hoya. What's it like looking back to that moment, going through everything that you achieved, and ultimately you've got Marines watching you now? Uh, That that was um, was uh, like an eye-opening experience. Like I knew where I was at, but it was actually like one of those rare moments we actually had some downtime. So I actually um, was able, like, I was just fortunate not to be doing anything in that particular day, and I was able to catch the fight. I just remember telling myself, you know, once I got back to the state, that I would, um, that I would definitely want to go back to pursuing boxing. Because before the Marine Corps, I was in, I was um, fighting as an amateur for for um, a little bit at a time. But I knew this was, I knew where, like, watching that experience, that I, I definitely want to get back to the sport of boxing as soon as I got back to the states. And it's crazy, right? You've gone from this thought process to becoming a world champion. And in one of your fights, I think you had essentially a parade full of Marines all coming out to support you for one of your entrances. It was yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, like, those are the things that, that really stick out because it just reminds me where I came from and where, I, where I'm at today. But I always um, always show my appreciation and gratitude for the people that, um, you know, helped pave the way for me to get to where I'm at today. And ultimately, this time in Iraq must have been incredible for you in in so many different ways. Obviously, as much as you want to go into detail, is there any stories you can tell us about your time in Iraq? I remember particularly reading the book, there was an RPG grenade thrown over your head and there was was bombs on the tracks and all that sort of stuff. I mean, yeah, it was definitely, um, I think for the most part, I I, um, just trying to tend to remember like those I served with, you know, those I'm still with, that are still with us today. Um, you know, I, I try to keep a close relationship for all those guys that I that I serve with overseas, um, men and women. But um, definitely, um, it's just like the convoys and, and just just always being on the alert every single day while I was out there was like one of the things that really stand that really stand out because um, you know, it made me appreciate just life in general a lot more. Especially um, when I had got back home, I appreciate little things like you know just running water and and, and grass and things because everything was just Sandy, there was no, there was, it wasn't like we had any like um, great plumbing for showers and things, and things of that nature. So like, I just appreciate like, like the little things, even like sleeping on a regular bed. Yeah, that, that's crazy to think of all the things in life we take for granted. And you went through right, this, yeah. you end up becoming a boxer, an extremely good one. And you go into the fight with Ito, one where you're a massive underdog, you're fighting for a world championship. You say in the book, it's like, aside from God almost, your daughter would have been 10 years old on that particular day. You produced an unbelievable performance. What was it like to hear and the new that day? Um, It it was one of the best experiences of my life, Um, especially when you got a a Hall of Famer ring announcer like Jimmy Lennon Jr. to to do the honors. So um, again, um, that thing, that, that day still plays in my head quite clearly. But, you know, it just shows, it just goes to show you the type of person that I am. Like I tune out all the, the negativity. I, like you mentioned, I was, I was a huge underdog, but again, um, that's because many, many didn't know the, the determination that I had within me that night. And then so many, so many other nights, but that, that night definitely will always stand out for the rest of my life. And it was just, it was just great to also have Marines on board on that particular night as well. And looking to possibly the biggest victory of your career, Carl Frampton is an absolute legend on these shows. I know it sent shockwaves through the world of boxing when you produced that victory. And it's made even more impressive by what was going on in your life in the lead up to it. I couldn't believe it when I was reading the book and it was like 10 days before, <laughs> are you going to get to the yeah. Are you're not going to get to the yeah, it, 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 it was rough. Like I was having issues with my passport and, and, and those just thought I'd have issues with Like no, I was, I was certainly stuck in Texas for like three or four days just trying to get my passport alone. And it, it, was, it, was, it was maddening. But um, you know, we we luckily we got we we got it done, and um, again, one of the biggest fights of my career with the great Carl Frampton, who's who's uh, who I was honored to share the ring with. Um, again, like people, most people didn't know at the time, I was always a fan of Carl Frampton. Carl Frampton did amazing things in 2016, becoming fighter of the year, and I just thought he he was like a real slick, smooth boxer. So it was it was just a, um, you know, another great experience for me to. Uh, and another story to share even down the road again with um with with those who who tuned in or heard about that fight. You know, our car fact was was a, was a gentleman. And again, though, it was, it was rough just getting to getting to Dubai. But I, I got there and 
I took care of business. You most certainly did. And I'd like to see you take care of business again against another UK fighter. I know you want Jordan Gill. I know you want Joe Cordina. Are we going to get to see Jamal Herring over on the UK? Oh, I, um, absolutely. That's that's what we're actually that's what we're actually focusing on now. Honestly, um, again, you see Emmanuel Navarrete. He's possibly moving up to fight for the vacated WBO title at 135. Man, I believe my good friend Archie Sharp is the next in line with um with Robert Bell for that title. And let's just say that title does go to the UK. Um, that could be a possibility for me to come to the UK. For a matchup against Archie Sharp, I know Archie wanted to fight me years years back, but it was just it was just the wrong timing, and I honestly wasn't in the plans with Ty Rank, of course. But um, yeah, who who knows if Archie gets to um, the WBO title? Then I know I've spoken with my promoter Lou DeBello about that recently, about possibly um looking out for that fight to see how it goes um in in, in the near future. I'd absolutely love to see that fight. I think it'd be a great one. It's been amazing to see how well you've done in boxing. Obviously, you had your career in Marines, and I believe you've done a bit of acting as well in West Side Story with Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was um, I, I was an extra for that one, but I, I, I just wanted to learn how like big films are uh, made, and it's a lot of work that goes. And I, honestly, I probably prefer just training in the ring at times than than being on set and doing the same scenes over and over again. So, but again, it was a great experience. I spoke to Steven Spielberg. Um, we shared obviously our experiences together, and he was a nice, he was a nice, he was a nice, um, nice gentleman. And rolling back the years, obviously, I know that you spent some time in foster care. A good friend of mine at school was in foster care, and I know how amazing foster parents can be for the development yeah. of children. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like for you? And ultimately, who was Jamal Herring growing up? I know you're big into your video games. Oh, and man. Your favorites. Like, like she, that's crazy. We used to call her Nanny. She just, she actually just turned 91, I believe, to like uh, the day before yesterday. So, you know, again, I still, I still, I stayed close with that, with that side, um, with my foster parents when I, that I came under, grew up under for, for a few years. But um, again, it, it was it was it was tough. It was tough, not in terms of um, like being the way I was treated. I was treated. I was, they they loved me to death to this day. I was treated. I was treated nice, and um, like like family. Um, thank God. But it was just like one of those things where you you didn't know because it was a new surrounding. Um, it was basically like starting all over, life all over again, and trying to like adapt into a new family. But again. Um, you know, for me, I was just lucky. Me and my brothers at the time, we were just lucky and to have a great family, like the Cruz family out in Amityville, Long Island. So, um, yeah, it, it, that was a, that was another um, that for me, honestly, it just made me learn at a young age how to appreciate um, people with different backgrounds. You know, because I, I I was actually placed in um in in a white home at first and I, and and they showed love and they, and they and they showed love so like for me I was just I was just like a early early age I was like um I learned that race really doesn't matter you know it was all about the individual and and and, and how they were brought up so for me um like again that's why I have fans everywhere you know I have fans in the UK Ireland and and, and so on because I I appreciate good people and and good people obviously appreciate the person that I am as well so for me, I think that that would just help me learn as a, as a younger as a, as a younger individual how to um, treat people not by what's on the outside, but who they are within. Even and the same goes to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps, you come around men and women of all um, races and, and backgrounds and religion, and that and and even as an adult, it made me appreciate a lot more what uh, people's upbringings as well and where they come from. Even now, my great my trainer Wayne McCullough. He, he's um you know he's from Belfast you know but me and Wayne we share so many stories together and we just we just instantly click and you know I love Wayne to death so it just just hearing you know how he was brought up and then I share how the way I was brought up we just we just easily gelled well yeah so you've got to get yourself to Belfast Jamal it's an amazing place yeah yeah I know a car actually invited me Wayne wants me to go um of course um, I'm friends with the Collin family so again um I, I have plenty of um you know, references to get to Belfast. So I, I, will, I will get there one of these days for sure. <laughs> well, Jamal, thank you so much for giving me some of your time. I really appreciate it. I had a great time reading the book, obviously, and speaking to you, you was even better. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Hopefully one day I get to see you over in the UK. Oh, no, I'll be over there. I'll be over there. Listen, Wayne right now, Wayne's making it a priority for me to get there for sure now. So I'll definitely get there. Wayne Wayne is like, yeah, we're going. Well, we can do something in person then in Belfast, Jamal. That'd be that'd be amazing. But again, thank Absolutely. you so much for speaking to me and hope to see you in the future.